Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the afternoon session uh, where we're going to be talking about uh, social media um, and we have uh, a great deal to discuss, uh, not just about um, the Sandy Hook incident but also subsequently uh, last week we had a number of, I think, lessons that we'll probably be uh, discussing as well. Uh, joining me for this, um, I'm delighted to say, is uh, Andy Carvin, um, at a Carvin on Twitter, um, who is a senior strategist from NPR. Uh, he has lost the words new media from his title, which is a victory, because when that goes away, it means it's, it's no longer uh, an adjunct to what you do. It's uh, central to the operation. Um, Andy is the author of a book, Dissident Witness, uh, about his experiences of uh, aggregating and uh, tweeting the Arab Spring, where he really established a protocol for many journalists who subsequently followed to use uh, the real-time social web for a more conversational, linked approach to news verification uh, and reporting. Um, on my immediate left is Chip DeMay, who's the uh, principal of Newtown High School. Uh, Chip was uh, one of the most consistent and calm presences on social media throughout Sandy Hook. I know that many people, not just in the community, but journalists uh, and other people outside uh, Newtown uh, became, sort of knew, him as a, knew him as a source. Um, and I wanted to start, uh, Chip, with you. Um, and again, just going back to that day, uh, because you, you, you had already established yourself as a, you're, you're, one of the, uh, you're an educator who um, uses technology. Uh, you had a presence already on social media. You used it to communicate with your students and the wider community. Um, and yet on that day, you became, as I say, somebody who was known within a very small community to somebody who was known and identifiable to a much wider community. Can you just talk us through, again, what happened on that day and where you were and what you were doing and, and what happened at your school? The, uh, on the 14th, uh, I, I was not in the district and uh, I was off-site at uh, a professional development seminar and received a phone call from school that, uh, that there had been an incident at Sandy Hook. So uh, immediately returning to the school, arrived at Newtown High School, and Newtown High School was in lockdown, as were all the other schools in the district. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have lockdown drills. Uh, they usually don't last very long. This was uh, not a drill, and it, it was uh, uh, lasting a considerable time. So as far as uh, information coming out, we didn't do any tweeting at that time or send anything out. At least uh, the administration did not. Uh, as much as we try to uh, keep the flow of information at a minimum during a lockdown, because it, it doesn't contribute to much positive when that happens. Uh, that kind of stuff leaks out uh, as well as leaks in. So uh, people in the building were receiving some information from the outside and, and uh, there wasn't much that people inside could send out other than they were in lockdown. The, the first message that we did send out was that the students in Newtown High School were safe. Right. Yeah. And what time was, what time was that? Uh, it, prior to the end of the school day, so I'm going to guess that it was uh, somewhere between 11 and 12 o'clock was my guess. Right, right. And um, as you say, you had information that was leaking in and leaking out. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you were a very measured presence, as I say, on uh, I followed your Twitter feed, I know a lot of other people did, mm -hmm. as just somebody who gave out information. Um, Lots of other uh, public officials who may have had a presence on social media uh, quite, for quite understandable reasons disappeared. Did you suddenly find that you were inundated with questions and people identifying you and asking you things? Uh, there, were, there were lots of questions. The, uh, I think that our role as far as uh, communicating was one of reassuring the community and the families. Uh, much more than it was delivering information. Uh, you know, we weren't at Sandy Hook. Uh, we were more concerned with uh, how we were going to demonstrate to the world that 
uh, we were strong and resilient. Mm -hmm. So it, during that time, uh, most of the tweets, if you go back and read them, were uh, thank yous. Uh, because I think that as much as it was important for uh, our healing, an event like this affects the world. And uh, one of the challenges that we've really had, even at the high school, is uh, how do we help? The kids at the high school very concerned about how they help. Uh, they wanted to, uh, uh, yeah, just as much as the Yankees wanted to help Sandy Hook, all, every kid at the high school wants to help Sandy Hook. So uh, those things are difficult because uh, Sandy Hook's inundated with people who want to help, even within the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so we received lots and lots of support from around the world, and uh, we wanted people to recognize that uh, we heard them and we appreciated it. Um, how did, did you did you feel? Did, was there a point at which you felt that you had gone from being somebody who was just a, a well, not just, but you know, when you, you know, you're a principal and you're looking after this smaller community? Um, did, did you feel any of the um, pressure that we were hearing about this morning? Uh, you know, were you, were you personally? Followed and uh, pursued uh, by the by the press uh, in the same way that Pat Loder was, who was talking about it this morning. Uh, I'm sure Pat Loder got far more attention than I did. Uh, our responsibility was really to protect the kids from the media. The, uh, the the vans that were in town were parked across the street from the high school for days, and as respectful as they were of the school grounds and not being on school grounds, uh, traffic at Newtown High School is just like traffic at every other high school. And uh, when traffic was backed up, uh, reporters would approach cars, you know, and, and uh, so administrators and the police would, would try to help the kids get into school without having to do that. Uh, I think that, that at that point, most of our communication was to uh, uh, help with the healing. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you deal with um, high school students in terms, as you say, that they were source material for the press as well? They are, I have a high schooler, they are notoriously uh, familiar with expressing themselves on social media, maybe a little bit too frequently. They were obviously going to talk about the incident, etc. Did you, how, did, you, did you talk to them about that as a school? Did you address how, they were, how their communications might be perceived uh, and how to handle the press who were stopping them at the gates? The, the, the students were fantastic. The students continue to be fantastic. The staff w really were the ones that we addressed the, the media issue with so that they can communicate on a one-on-one -on -one basis with students. Um, very few issues arose with the media at school other than uh, being approached at home or, or uh, being approached uh, as they left school. Uh, those were the major issues. Other than that, uh, I think that the students were so deeply hurt that they understood very clearly uh, what would be helpful for them to talk about and what would not be helpful for them to talk about. You're talking about strength and you have a lot of very powerful and emotional messages of support throughout. Um, how did you maintain the right emotional balance and tone. Um, as I say, you were really remarkably measured throughout all of this, which it must have been extremely difficult for you as well, because you knew the staff and uh, some of the victims at Sandy Hook. It was very, very close to your part of the community. Uh, people in schools care very much about kids. And uh, th that's something that we always talk about. And I don't think it's things that uh, kids and families always see to the degree that it really, really takes place. And this was an opportunity to let families know that uh, the school cared very much about their kids. Um, I had some coaching, you know, the, uh, during these types of events, uh, it's important to get alternative perspectives on what's going on. Uh, this is not something that there is a plan book for. And navigating through this type of situation means talking with some people who are uh, well versed in uh, trauma and this type of situation. Dr. John Woodall is a resource that I use regularly, uh, personally and professionally, to manage these situations. What, what, what advice would you give to others who are? Uh 
if you like, in your situation or, 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 or principals who are now thinking about how do, you commun- how do you communicate more broadly both within and outside a school? Because I hope that nobody else is going to be put in your position, but you know, we suspect that they might be. Uh, I think that we were very lucky that the structures were in place ahead of time. This, this, this could not be developed uh, on the spur of the moment. So as far as establishing a blog that, it, that uh, uh, if, even if students don't go there for information, their parents go there for information regularly at the school. And that's where we posted the letters that we sent home in addition to the automated phone calls and Twitter. Uh, but having that structure of a, a clear system of communication between and, and pieces of communication that overlap, we didn't do any one form of communication, so the the calls uh, were repeated with the blog, were repeated with Twitter, so that the message was certain to get out there. And uh, it's a slightly, um, maybe a beside the point question, but we we were curious about what your policy is at, uh, at Newtown High about phones in school. Uh, do you, do, you, do, you, do you, are they banned? Do your students have phones? Are they are they hand them in at the door? Do they use them when they shouldn't? Uh, I don't think it's so much a question of whether or not to have phones. It's a question of um, when do you use the phones and how do you use mm-hmm. the phones. So we encourage the teachers to find ways to take advantage of student technologies. Um, the, the times that I will take away phones is uh, when students walk into me in the hallways as they're doing this. Uh, but uh, we care about student safety, and, and walking down stairwells using phones is not a good idea. But using them to access and share information is something that we're promoting. And do you, do, do, we're now, um, say, sort of approaching a kind of a, a six, six months since um, the incident. Uh, is it something which, because you're still public and you're still very public and open about, about your work and what you're doing, uh, do you find that you're frequently contacted by people still to talk about Sandy Hook or, as a, again, as a source of information about the community and about the town? Or has that largely gone away? Uh, we still get contacted as a school. Um, and as I was just saying earlier to somebody, the, the key for us in terms of interaction with the media during this event was... Um, we were more than welcome to speak with anybody who was as concerned about our healing as we were. And if it was something that would facilitate healing for the students and the staff and the community, then we were glad to do it. Mm-hmm. Andy, I want to go to you now. Now, you, you were, as I say, sort of really hailed um, and uh, recognised throughout the Arab Spring as being somebody who brought a new technique to journalism. You were also... Uh, during Sandy Hook, uh, where you were also tweeting um, very regularly throughout the day, you attracted a certain amount of criticism. I mean, Michael Wolf, who we know writes reasonably critical press columns about many things, uh, wrote, wrote a column about you um, for The Guardian saying that just the press, that there was, there was the too much, you, you were spreading too much false information through asking for verification, you were being over-emotional, etc. Looking back on it now, can you tell me sort of again a little bit about uh, the day and what you were doing and how that sort of how how you were thinking through that process and then we'll maybe talk at the end of that about uh, some of the pushback that you got from other journalists in the community. So sometime around 10 a.m. that day, I received tweets from just random people that follow me asking me if I had heard about a shooting at a school. Uh, they were getting reports of it. And so I hadn't, and they told me uh, the town it was in, so I went on Twitter and did, you can do a search around a particular geographic area, so I just started monitoring the traffic. And uh, one of the first thing I saw were uh, Twitter accounts from first responders, um, some of them official, some of them personal, saying that they were rushing to the scene and they didn't know the details yet, but something had happened. And then as time went by, I started seeing tweets from family members from some local politicians, from students that were in lockdown, trying to figure out what was going on. And um, as I began to capture those, um, you started seeing television networks picking it up, first the local level, but then uh, nationally and internationally. And so um, I basically began monitoring as many of these things as possible, while at the same time being part of a 
core group of people within NPR's newsroom focusing solely on the incident that day. And so we ha essentially had an email list set up in which any time that there was a report that had come in that we either could confirm or could not confirm, we shared it with each other as quickly as possible so we knew what to keep close to the vest and, and also share what we felt confident about. And so uh, I spent the day mainly parsing the information that was coming in from the outside to get a better understanding of it. Um, my Twitter account is different from a, twi uh, from a typical news Twitter account in the sense that it, it doesn't serve as a news wire. I work with my Twitter followers to collect information from a variety of sources and hash out what's happening in many ways like a newsroom would. Uh, my Twitter followers, I've got around 90,000 of them, and during the Arab Spring, for example, they were able to translate content for me from every Arabic dialect in the region. They would track shipping lanes and flight routes and help me identify weapons and munitions, put, da put together uh, um, background materials on certain political leaders and protesters and the like. So uh, I have this army of people who follow me that, w that volunteered to do these research roles. And so I began asking people to do the same based on what we were hearing. And so one of the things I did was, as I heard other news organizations make certain claims, such as a second shooter or a purple van some, somehow being involved, I cited that news organization and then asked my Twitter followers if they've seen any other news organization offer independent confirmation. And some of the times they'd say, yes, uh, uh, Lieutenant Vance was just talking about this so on the record, so we know that's true. Or this other news organization speculated about it, but we've seen nothing else. And so we would hash that out. And basically, that's what we did all day. So in the case of Michael Wolf, and, and, and really just a handful, I mean, I mean, literally, I can count on one hand the number of journalists who complained to me over the next 24 hours about what I was doing. Their argument, in part at least, was that I was using social media to propagate rumors, whereas if you actually looked at my tweets, each of my tweets that contained a bit of questionable information was always in the context of so-and-so is claiming this, what do we know about it, how has it been sourced, and, and, and how do we put this to rest, or how do we figure it out? Um, and of course, there are times if a person suddenly drops into a, a Twitter stream in the same way, if they drop into a, a live news broadcast for just one or two minutes, they may not get the full context of what we're doing, but my Twitter followers, they, they follow me for a very specific reason. It's because I try to use these techniques to work with them. And they, they know that I'm not just some random Twitter account spouting out stuff. But is there a case to say that, um, and we've seen this in the past week as well, that just by the act of asking for verification, you push, uh, inadvertently push incorrect information a little bit further, whereas some news organizations are now saying don't tweet it unless you would actually report it. I think news organizations, when they're concerned about that, are being naive as to how much this information was already propagated. Uh, during last week in Boston, especially towards the end, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were simultaneous listeners to the scanner traffic. Mm -hmm. And tens of thousands of them were probably posting on Facebook and Twitter. And most news organizations generally ignored it. But what was being discussed in the scanner traffic was about 15 minutes to sometimes 30 minutes ahead of the news organizations, both in terms of getting things right and getting things wrong. And so whenever I see a a, a bit of bubbling up of information that's clearly a rumor. People don't know, necessarily know what they're talking about, but it's spreading like wildfire. I actually think it's my responsibility to jump in and say, hey, hang on a second. What's your source? How do you know this is confirmed? Are you just throwing around journalistic jargon because that's what you think we talk? Uh, or do you actually have this confirmed by talking to multiple independent sources? And so I think news organizations, still, many of them operate in a world where we're used to being the sole arbiters of information. And when a breaking news story would happen, we'd sort through the rumors, we'd sort through the facts, the rumors would hit the cutting room floor, and the public would be none the wiser. With social media today, the public is completely aware of all these rumors, uh, and, and reports, and are playing a vital role in spreading them for good or for ill. Now, we can pretend that's not going on, or we could acknowledge it and try to chime in with them and say, you may want to pull back on this, or let's parse out this one, because we're hearing the same thing. Uh, uh, and so I, I actually do think it's, I think there needs to be a new role in, the, in, in journalism where certain staff 
during breaking news, they know they know what's going on in what's what's going on in the newsroom. They know what people are discussing online, and they serve as a facilitator in wh in whatever appropriate way there can be. Um, you mentioned the police scanner. Uh, how much has changed even in the six months between um, Sandy Hook and, say, Boston? Because this is something that we were discussing previously to, uh, to, 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 to the panel, where you said you thought there was a, a really quantitative difference now. Well, I think when Sandy Hook happened, there were plenty of people who were aware how to access scanner traffic online. But I'd still say it was essentially... Uh, the bailiwick of geeks. You know, it was a core group of people who were already interested in scanner traffic. It was hobbies of theirs and or people interested in following live strings, streams. And it propagated to a certain extent beyond that because obviously we were discussing scanner traffic that day and had to, had to, had to deal with some of the rumors that spread that way. But compare that to last week where very, very quickly that first day people started spreading through major social networks like Reddit, uh, as well as Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere, where to find access to the different uh, scanners. So whether it was uh, uh, whether it was specifically Boston or Mass, uh, Mass uh, State PD, uh, uh, MSP, whichever one it was, those got out quickly. So by the time we re reached Friday, literally hundreds of thousands of people were w listening to them. So many that there had to be volunteers who emulated the audio coming from those streams and made them available elsewhere because some of these sites couldn't handle the traffic. And so the public is getting a much stronger sense of the possibilities of how to monitor uh, official channels in real time. The challenge is, is just because it's official, they don't necessarily know what's true and what's not. And they don't know whose voices are talking. They don't know the, you know, the codes that are being used. Uh, they, don't, they don't always realize that there are tactical channels that are being used where the most important information is going back and forth. But obviously, they don't want that uh, aired publicly. And so, um, so again, it's the situation where people, uh, they, they almost know uh, a little too much for their own good. Uh, and so they realize that it's there. They try to utilize it. They, they share it with your, their friends, but don't always understand the implications of what they're sharing. Mm -hmm. And so why aren't more of us in media playing a role and helping them parse that? Mm -hmm. Chip, I wanted to ask you, um, e e Everybody we've heard from uh, from the Newtown community today has talked about a singularity of focus on uh, looking after um, people within the community, protecting them. Uh, you're all at the centre of the story. How uh, aware were you of how the story was being reported as it was uh, as it was as it was unfolding? Where were you getting your sources of information from? Was that all really from one to one? Communication with officials, or did you did you at any point look at the social media traffic and the and the news coverage um, of the day? Uh, I didn't see the news for a week. Probably it was all internal. Right, mm -hmm. right. So you had no sense of whether you know your school was or, or, ha, and what about the students? Did they have it? Did you have a sense of that where they get their information from, or how they would uh, how they were being affected by how the story was reported? Uh, not so much. I, I think that, uh, again, uh, they were in a real serious state of shock. And I, I think that some of them were uh, probably, for very good reasons, avoiding the news. Mm -hmm. it's, um, Andy, just talking about the um, problem of the speed and the distance that incorrect information n n now, now reaches. You know, we, we heard this morning that reporters from the other side of the world were ringing up reporters in Newtown and asking for them to uh, verify or confirm completely wild rumours, which, which were definitely not true. What, tell us a bit about that dynamic. And again, you said, you know, it's, it's our job to intervene and influence this. But how does it... How can, we, how can we do something which positively affects the speed of the spread of bad information? Well, I mean, social media now, combined that with 24-hour news, has basically created a game of telephone run amok. 
uh, people are passing along information. And even that may start as reliable information by the time it gets through its fifth or sixth iteration being passed along, there's the possibility that it won't be in any context. And unfortunately, there are some bad actors out there who will purposely take information, pull it out of context, and spread it just to see how far they can get it to spread. And you know, people, you know, they have no shame in situations like this. What's What's interesting is that comparing the number of breaking news stories I've covered in North Africa and the Middle East versus a situation like Sandy Hook or Boston for that matter, the chatter is very different because in the case of the Middle East, you had a smaller number of people who are eyewitnesses and that's getting passed along through, I mean, literally a, a, a larger geographic area. And so, you know, the average person does in America doesn't know that much about Egypt or Bahrain or whatever. And so I think there's a bit more listening going on and, and asking of questions. Whereas I think when you have a situation that's relatively in your backyard, and I'd say even if you're a couple states away from the location, that's your backyard, everyone's talking to everyone immediately. Do you know anyone there? Are they okay? Have you heard anything of this? The chatter just explodes because people have much much more of a vested interest in it. You know, ultimately, you know, the U.S. is made up of, it's a community of small communities. In the same way that if you just heard some of the stories coming out of Boston, so many people who knew the victims, like I, I have friends and colleagues who either knew the victim, one of the victims that died, or one of the, uh, the suspects. It's that small of a town, even though we're talking over a town, a metropolitan area of well over a million people. So information and, 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 and connections happen very, very quickly. And so when, that, when it's playing at real time much closer, I think the scale of that chatter, it's, it's bigger, it's broader, and much more intense, and makes it all the harder, I think, to sort through. Does that mean that um, when incidents like Sandy Hook happen, that we have a slightly different responsibility, that the press has a slightly different responsibility, that actually you know, being quiet rather than noisy is a, is a, is a better response? Well, I, for a while now, like many people, I've, I've had my concerns with the 24-hour news cycle. It's, there's, you don't allow dead air on television during breaking news, it's just not acceptable. So people keep talking and talking and talking. That sometimes allows for mistakes to be made or information to be shared possibly faster than it should. We saw examples of that this past week, especially on Wednesday with numerous news organizations reporting that suspects uh, were in custody when that, that was the furthest thing from the truth at that particular moment in time. So. Uh, you know, it's 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 a difficult dynamic because even even if you set aside uh, television news, online news, like for for print papers, uh, people who, as part of their jobs, use Twitter and Facebook for reporting, things are speeding up faster and faster than we've ever had before. But I I like to argue that in certain cases, if you're able to get your followers on social media to get used to it, you can actually. Uh, exercise the right to slow down. And so there were times during Sandy Hook as well as this past week in Boston where Twitter followers would frantically email or t uh, tweet to me some particular question. And rather than me blathering on every single thing I knew, I would say, let me get back to you. And I'd go silent for a while. I'd go check with our sources internally at NPR. I'd, I'd go turn on the local affiliate to see what they were reporting. Um, uh, if, if there was something that was being reported um, differently by two different news organizations, rather than just you know stick with one of them because they seemed more credible, I would share both of them, but then ask my Twitter followers to debate how these were possibly sourced and why. And so by creating situations where you can scrutinize things and slow things down to a certain extent, because no one ever said that social media has to be fast. It's, we've made a habit of it being fast. And I think once the breaking news first happens, even while it's taking place, we can pull back just a little bit because the difference between tweeting something in five seconds and 50 seconds or five minutes can be a huge difference in getting the facts right or wrong. And is that something that you've actually put into practice yourself as well? Have you found that you, you, you moderate your own... Uh, Behavior. Yeah, like I, I, someone, someone asked me how much stuff I was sharing that day, and I said I'm holding back 75% of what I'm hearing just because there's 
there's too much noise. There were too many things that seemed strange. Like, uh, for example, I didn't share anything about the Facebook page that turned out to be the brother's page. It just seemed too easy at that point. Uh, and also the fact that he, he, it, he wasn't in that specific location. He was in New Jersey or I forget where. I, I, I just thought, let's see if we can contact someone or find someone in his follower list who knows him. But meanwhile, other news organizations went with it. It also appeared on, on, on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and elsewhere. And not long after that, you started to see uh, all of these outlets having to retract because the brother posted a message finally. He went public and said, stop harassing me. This isn't me. I'm not there. Uh, and I, I think that was one of the most egregious stakes that, uh, mistakes that day because not only was he finding out that uh, his mother was dead, his brother is dead, uh, the brother was likely responsible for these, this atrocity, but now people were pointing the fingers at him. I can only imagine what that must have felt like. The closest thing you can compare it to were those uh, two North African boys who appeared on the cover of the Post a few days ago because users at Reddit and 4chan went through a collection of photos taken from the scene in Boston and basically parsed it out based on they've got backpacks, they're looking in other directions, oh, and oh they happen to have brown skin. And I mean, this is sort of raises a, a question um, which I think started uh, with Sandy Hook, uh, and was still became it became clear during Boston that we hadn't found an adequate answer to it. Which is how do you influence? How, how does one influence those communities of uh, people who who may think that they're doing the right thing but are actually doing I- I- incalculable damage by? A, mi- a misidentification of individuals is, is absolutely key to that. I think pe- more people involved in the news business have to take a greater stake in these communities th- themselves. So I feel personally responsible on Twitter just because that's the community where a group of followers uh, joined me and have been helping me in all sorts of ways. It could have just as easily been Facebook or, or Google Plus or something else. That just happens to be the one that worked for me. Uh, but for example, when the folks at Reddit were diving in head first, they were using a lot of really interesting techniques to, to, to examine these photos. It's just that they lacked a lot of the context, and, and certain people there were willing to share it without, uh, without, making, without reminding people we don't know anything about these folks and, whether, uh, and we need to assume that they're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, and so I, I think there's something to be said about having... Uh, people who do work like me in more communities like Reddit paying closer attention. So by the time I found out what was going on in Reddit, it was too late. It was already out there. I, I, found, I learned about it on Twitter. They had already done all of this work. And um, you know, it, I, I, I wish I could have spent the time earlier on that space, but you know, I can't be everywhere at once. And so I think there, there do need to be more people in my position where we are acting as journalists but also are seen as residents and members of certain communities and can de- develop credibility in those spaces. And so if we raise our hands and say, hang on a sec, folks, enough of them will take it seriously that they'll pause for a moment. And what, what, what advice would you give? Because you know, you're somebody who's always said, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I, I started off as an activist. Um, and you know, now, now you work for a journalistic organization. But... What advice would you give for people in communities uh, who, as I say, in, 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 in CHIP we have an example of somebody who, who, who did a very uh, public but very measured job. Um, you are now a source if you're at the centre of a story and you're identifiable through your, through your public office or, or what you're doing. What, what kind of a, again, what's the role of somebody there uh, in that position, given that they are themselves a, a, a publisher now or can be a publisher? Well, I think it's important for public officials and others who have, are potentially going to be in the spotlight for whatever reason that they go beyond the usual journalistic boundaries of who they get to know in the business. Because first, the first obvious example are bloggers. Many places now have bloggers who are covering local community news stories and events and the like. But then there, it's quite likely that uh, there are groups of people on Twitter and Facebook. There may be Facebook pages about the community or activities taking place in the community. You don't necessarily have to become an expert at all of them, but but 
some, you and some of your colleagues ideally should be aware that they're out there and at least develop a basic relationship with them. Uh, in the same way that I think national news organizations need to uh, doing a better job at, at uh, cultivating sources in, uh, in communities uh, elsewhere. Like I've been able, I feel like I've been able to cover a number of these stories because before I came to NPR, I used to do a lot of online work uh, bringing together volunteers during natural disasters, such as uh, the Boxing Day tsunami and Hurricane Katrina. So I already had a network of first responders at the international level who knew who I was and would share information with me. So when Twitter finally came along, I started learning about who their friends were at the state and local level. And so it's not unusual for one of them to alert me and say, hey, this is going on here. You need to, you need to tell uh, your local NPR affiliate or whatever. Uh, and so I think the, the world's both a bigger place and a smaller place than it's ever been before. And we have all of these niche communities that are online that may not seem relevant right now, but they're extremely relevant to members of your community already because that's where they're going to talk about your community. And so the more time you can invest in it and getting to know them, the better off I think you're going to be, both in terms of getting the right information out there and also mobilizing them as volunteers so they can help you rather than being counterproductive. I just want to ask both of you actually about um, it, in terms of emotional response on social media. A Andy, you're somebody who very much wears your heart on your sleeve when you're tweeting um, too, when, mu when too much. When it's appropriate. I, I mean, I don't always, but I mean, in the context of that day, that I, I travel a lot for work, and that was the first day in months I had been able to go to school, uh, my son's uh, school, and walk him to the door and drop him off. He's four and a half years old. My daughter's at elementary school. She was six. Uh, so I felt like I had a reaction that day the same way I had a reaction to Boston this past week because I'm from Boston. I used to walk two blocks to the marathon uh, uh, line at the 24th, 23rd mile marker approximately to cheer everyone on. So I'm not going to hide that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to dive in and start saying, oh, isn't it time for, for Congress to do this or that? Or sh why haven't we invaded this particular country to stop that dictator? I can be, I feel like I can be emotional and acknowledge my humanity about these stories without getting involved with the politics and the policy of it. And I think many journalists don't separate those two. They think if you can't do one, you can't do the other. And I'm not saying you have to be sitting there and, 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 and shrieking and, being, and having all these histrionics while things are going on, because then you can't function. But acknowledging that this is a very stressful and upsetting situation, I think when you're reporting through social media, that makes you human. And if you start behaving more like a robot using social media, then I think that's when people get skeptical of you as a journalist. And what about you, Chip? As I say, how do you feel about kind of like emo emotional and emotional responses online? I, I think that the part of our job in communicating is not necessarily uh, have to do with the news. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for doing it, and the primary reason is so that uh, parents and community members uh, feel comfortable knowing, know, knowing that we're taking care of their kids. Mm -hmm. So a big part of that message is, is in the tone, and a big part of that message is in the delivery. And when we talk about the time, the, uh, as Ms. Lodra said, Newtown doesn't have somebody that does communications, nor does mm -hmm. the high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the challenge is getting information out quickly, uh, but at the same time doing the work. And so we try hard to make sure that the message communicates as much in tone as it does in the words. Do you think you're unusual in how you use communications in the school? Because, I, you know, I kind of looked at the school retrospectively, having noticed what you were doing, and you seem to be really kind of quite advanced in terms of uh, the techniques that you're deploying and, and how comfortable you are with the, with the medium. Oh, I don't think it's that advanced. Uh, I, do, I do think that uh, the, there may be a difference in the medium, uh, or the technology, but there's not a difference in uh, the level of caring and the level of communication. Um, I want to take up a, a, a couple of questions, uh, well, the, several questions I'm sure that people have from the from the floor. I had a, one question here, actually, uh, which has come through Twitter, where uh, Andy, you say um, if you could, if it, it, 
journalists have a job to get involved where they see uh, bad information proliferating and stopping it. Um, somebody would like to know how you might have done that on Reddit because you know you're dealing with these very uh, quite opinionated communities who, as you say, it spreads like wildfire. Is there is there a way of doing that? Are we are there is, are there a way of developing standards or, 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 or verifying or not verifying information in a viral? I uh, think context? it can be tough if you're not already respected within that community. Like, I think if I had suddenly dropped Twitter and gone into Reddit and said, well, hang on, folks, I don't know if I could have gotten enough people's attention because I'm not really a known quantity there. You know, I mean, I just, I've been on Reddit for a while. Some people know me there, but it's, it's not my thing. Um, and, and I think that's part of the problem, whereas there are enough people aware of me on Twitter that if I say We've, we're seeing reports from certain news organizations that don't make sense, people take pause and they spread my tweets around very quickly because they know that's one of the roles I play there. And so, and it, the, the, the challenge is, I think that with Twitter, it's, it's kind of like, it's an ecosystem of everything. It's, it's everything that you see in real life is reflected somewhere on Twitter. Whereas with Reddit, it's a very specific community with certain norms and mores and and they treat outsiders in ways that aren't always welcoming, uh, at least in the pr perspective of those outsiders. And so it can be harder, I think, to go in and put in a more measured journalistic response. Having said that, I, I think it's possible. I, like, I've been very tempted by the idea of creating a subreddit, in other words, a sub-community within Reddit, that's basically where NPR staff can feel comfortable to hang out with Redditors to talk about breaking news. And as part of that would be to tell them when we think they're doing a good job and when we think they're doing something that's very counterproductive, if not dangerous. Um, and so, um, but there, uh, it's, it's, so it really depends on the community. It's a hard question to ask, particularly about Sandy Hook, because we had a, a, there, was, there was a more detailed discussion of this, I think, about Boston. But some journalists raised with me um, the very hard question of, of course there's going to be di misinformation early in a story. Uh, and you talked about, was there a second shooter? Was there somebody who had been arrested when they hadn't been arrested? Mm -hmm. uh, the misidentification of the brother. Um, a couple of journalists have asked, well, does it really matter? You know, ultimately, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy. The same, you know, the, the, there are 26 people dead. That doesn't change. All of the rest of the speculation ultimately will go away. So, is, you know, what is the real damage done when you have uh, people running amok on social media and spreading? <coughs> well, I, I think the, one of the clearest examples of that would have been last Wednesday with these reports that went on for some time that suspects were in custody. Um, even though uh, people were staying closer to home at that particular point, it wasn't in lockdown in the same way it was on Friday. And so, God forbid something had happened during those hours where uh, news organizations were reporting that, uh, 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 that suspects had been captured and then people went out and something had happened. I mean, you know, of course, this is all hypothetical. And thankfully, we haven't seen a situation where social media has caused has put people's lives in danger. But you could argue on smaller cases it has. So like the, the, uh, one of the Moroccan boys who was on the cover of, of the post and then being circulated on Reddit and Twitter before that, he was saying he's afraid to go to school. He's scared out of his mind. His parents are worried that someone's just gonna show up and shoot him. Because even if it's clear that he didn't do it, some person who doesn't like uh, Arabs or North Africans might just take him out because they're aware of him now. And so there are consequences, but I think we need to remember that it, this is all the consequences about all of us getting it wrong. It's not, it didn't happen just because social media said it was wrong. It's because a feedback loop was created between media and uh, mainstream media and social media where all the worst information was bubbling up to the top. And that's what we need to figure out how to avoid. Um, I want to go to the uh, audience to take questions. Now we have the mics, if you can put your hands up. Uh, in the air. Um, I'm not going to try the one side of the room, the other, but if we go over here first. Hi, uh, Mike Patrick from the Republican American newspaper in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. This is a question for Andy. Uh, you mentioned earlier about um, uh, journalists being the arbiters of, of information, and I, I think that's true, but I would also argue that we're the, the conservators of it as well, and, and, and the custodians of it. And, uh, 
it's, it's traditionally and idealistically been rumor, innuendo, intentionally false information over here, and journalism over here. Do you see at all in, in your approach to it, uh, in, in tweeting something that says, well, we've heard such and such is true, can you confirm it? Do you see that line uh, eroding a little bit, and is that a positive or negative thing if you see that? Well, I, th I think what's different now is, you know, if you just think about the word media, what does it mean? Middle. The information is over here on one side. This is where the event happened. This is where the truth and the rumors are all being tossed around. The public is somewhere over here, and it's our job to parse that through it and sort it out and make sure that whatever the public receives is the best representation possible of what happened so they can be more informed because of it. That's, I think that's an ideal of journalism that's always been around. The problem is, or the reality is now, anyone who's over on the public side can do an end run around us whenever they feel like it now because there are people over here observing the event, they've got their camera phones out, they're tweeting about what they've just seen, they're talking among themselves. And so th there are times where I worry the media almost feels like it's talking to itself while the internet is doing its own thing. And so I think we can still, we, I think we can still see ourselves as custodians of the truth and trying to get the most accurate narrative possible. But I th at the same time, I think it's a missed opportunity if we ignore all this other chatter that's taking place because not everyone's gonna see our reporting. Our, the final version of the story. People are going to go, I mean, if you just look at, 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 at when you see research on people's uh, literacies in different news topics, geographic literacy, whatever, I mean, it's, it can be extremely abysmal at times. And I think it can get worse because people think they know what they're talking about. And some of them do, some of them don't. So I, I think while we're doing continue to do that one really important aspect of our job that's always been there. I think there's this evolving role. Uh, part of NPR, NPR's mission actually says, if you look at its mission statement, it says to create a more informed public. And I think that's actually distinct from just informing people because it's giving them the tools they need to be more informed and better informed and better citizens in the process. And so uh, I think if, if we try to take that more traditional, narrow approach of what it means to be a, a journalist, we're missing opportunities to uh, strengthen civil society. Uh, there's a question over there, right to my far right. Hi, uh, I'm Ilya Meritz from WNYC, the public radio station here in New York City. Uh, my question is for Principal Dumais. Uh, I'm really intrigued that, that you uh, are such an active presence on Twitter, but I'm curious because Twitter has this effect of, um, of leveling the playing field, making everyone a little bit equal, regardless of how many followers each party may have. Do you have conversations then with students uh, on your Twitter feed? And if so, what's that like? How do you determine the tone? And I guess particularly around the time of Sandy Hook, were you talking with students that way as well as in the halls and in the school? Uh, you said something very interesting when you were talking about the, those different levels, whether it be uh, community member or principal or parent or student. Uh, during a tragedy like this, uh, all of those things dissolve and everybody is on the same level. So uh, everybody hurt the same, and everybody needed to hear the same message. But I communicate with students uh, whenever they're willing to uh, uh, admit to the world on Twitter that they're talking to their principal. <laughs> yes, talking to your principal on Twitter is probably a bit like talking to your mum on Twitter. It's not something you, 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 you want to be seen doing. Uh, and as we say to students on the first day here, which is uh, our academic dean says, I won't friend you on Facebook. <laughs> um, is there another? I think I, was, I thought I saw another question over there, but maybe not. Oh, two here. So if we start uh, at the back and then come forward. Sorry. Um, I'm Tim Curran, uh, formerly of SiriusXM, now a freelancer. Um, Andy, given everything that you've just said, what do you see as the, uh, let's say, medium term? I won't ask you to get out the real crystal ball, but what do you say is the sees the medium term future for mainstream media? Is it riding herd over uh, social media mainly, or, or how do you see it shaking out? 
Well, I, I think the medium term is a continuation of what we're already seeing in that many major newsrooms have created news desks that have social media staff. Um, so, for example, uh, at Reuters, uh, they have a guy named Anthony DeRosa who is quite good at sorting through real-time information and, uh, and, and, and working with their reporters to, to, uh, to cover the story. Uh, the New York Times, Robert Mackey and his colleagues at The Lead, I think they're some of the best ones out there when it comes to finding social media material and putting it in the proper journalistic context. Uh, my brother is social media editor at the AP, oddly enough, and so he's worked wrangling you know several hundred uh, bureaus around the world trying to uh, encourage their reporters to use social media more effectively uh, so uh, that transition is already happening uh, in the sense that social media is becoming a is being integrated into reporting but I think the 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 harder part is how do you push the culture along a little further? Because I've, I've had people ask me, you know, what's the difference between journalists who really get social media and those who don't? And people unfortunately often presume that it's a generational difference, which I think is laughable because I've, I've dealt with interns at NPR that are very much social media Luddites when it comes to journalism. And then I know journalists who have just recently retired who, who are the envy of the office because they're so good at it. I think the real difference between the two is uh, uh, the ones that really get social media are the ones that know they have to be a bit more vulnerable publicly. They have to be comfortable opening themselves up, admitting what they know, and more importantly, what they don't know, and being good listeners to in public. And not everyone's comfortable with that. It's, it's not a natural part of the way journalism has worked in the past. And so I think medium term, we're going to be figuring that out. How do we find the right people or recruit the right people who have that level of comfort and confidence along with the journalistic chops that it can add to the quality and diversity of our reporting? Okay, we have, yes, the question there. Hi, I'm Fletcher Fisher. I'm the uh, business manager of the IBW. We represent most of the broadcast television unions in New England. And it was, we've had a lot of people at Newtown. We've had a lot of people going crazy in Boston. I'm just curious as to your um, opinion on the future. When we look at um, how the media companies we work with now are reacting to the new phase of journalism, it feels like this the Wild West all over again. Um, they don't know how to continue the business model that they've had with over-the-air broadcasting because there is no real business model on the internet. And you know, like you said before, reporters are, are getting jumped by the public. So it's, it feels like the public's talking to the public and the media is, is fighting it out. What do you see as a, a future mix between the two and how, how journalism itself survives as opposed to novice people acting like journalism journalists and journalists not, you know, getting the story beat every time. If I knew the true answer to that, I'd try to find some venture capitalists, take them out for dinner, and see if we could work out something interesting. I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, Clay Shirky has said on a number of occasions, it's, it's not that journalism is dying, it's business models are dying. Um, platforms are dying, or they're evolving. And we haven't figured out necessarily how to sustain ourselves and thrive, given those changes. And so, Honestly, I don't know how it's going to be replaced. Coming from public radio, you know, we've had over 40 years' experience of being part of our communities uh, to the point that enough people feel comfortable donating to their local member station. You know, NPR, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for member stations receiving donations from you know, upwards of like 4 million people in the U.S. Uh, and so it's a model that works for us, but at the same time, uh, at NPR, we rely on a certain amount of sponsorship and, uh, and online sponsorship, which is what we call advertising, but it's not it's it's done somewhat differently, um, and that's not always enough as well. And so everyone is figuring out you know what what, what types of new uh, business ventures you can develop, partnerships, um, um, nonprofit journalism, uh, in, or more entrepreneurial on nonprofit journalism that could become for profit journalism. Uh, I mean, this is a, definitely not my area of expertise. Uh, so uh, journalists are sometimes notoriously bad at business. And so uh, I, I think I'm going to leave my predictions at that. Um, but no matter what, where the business models go, they're still going to have to contend with the fact that 
more people are going to be online than ever before. More information is going to be tracked. Less information is going to be private. And all of this stuff is going to be out there in some type of matrix that some of us will know how to process for good and some for evil. I was going to follow up on that, actually, and ask um, about that strategic aspect of it, which is um, you know, how... So another part of that question was the public is talking to the public and the press is left on the outside. Um, that's not always the case, but what's the strategy uh, in the newsroom, or even for public officials to say, well, you know, we can change this as well. We increasingly see public officials going, uh, presenting themselves as sources, and, and what's the best way to do that, and how should you say yourself? And I don't that? know what the best way is, especially for politicians. You know, Cory Booker is often held up as, as, a, as an example of how to use social media well, and he's certainly quite comfortable at Twitter and uh, uh, has... Uh, has created a following on Twitter unlike any other local politician I've ever seen before. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every politician is going to go out there and create a Twitter account and expect that thing to happen, the same thing to happen. I think in his case, the reasons why it's been successful is it matches his personality fairly well. And so w whether it's officials or their staff and the co or combination of both, they need to figure out who's most co comfortable being parts of informal conversations. And being part of more of a level playing field and being willing to listen. And some people are better at that than others. Um, I also wanted to ask you, both of you, um, one of the things which is very striking about uh, events that happen now, and this is particularly, I, I mean, I think it's particularly striking when it's a, it's a really traumatic event like um, Sandy Hook, is that so much of what was actually happening at the time is left there. In other words, there is an archive which is immediately accessible of uh, everything that was going on that day and what people were talking about, as well as just the newspaper clippings. Um, have either of you gone back and reviewed or looked at, or, 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 or do you, Andy, look at um, incidents in the archive as well? And do you think about sort of, you know, because you, you're leading a community which is actually both grieving but also wanting to move on and not wanting this to be a defining uh, part of how people think about Newtown. You know, what, what's the effect of having that uh, event live on with such a, a, what we call a long tail on the internet? I, I think that not so much that I go back to read the archive, but every time that I write something, I try to remember that it's going to be in the archive. Right. Yes. Um, one thing I'm always amazed by is whenever I go back and look at archives of my tweets or grab a bunch of social materials to create some kind of story out of it, is I'm always amazed at how much I didn't remember the way I thought I did. You know, even it's, it's Twitter, being online is just like trying to cover story anywhere else. There's a fog of war that happens in breaking news, especially when the adrenaline is rushing and, and people are getting hurt all around you that you can't avoid it. And so I think it's actually quite important as uh, to whenever uh, minor stories and major stories alike, I think it's very healthy to go back and review what you said and what you didn't say. So um, for example, on uh, the day of Sandy Hook, uh, I knew that Michael Wolf and people like that weren't going to be happy with what I did. So the first thing I did is I went and took a copy of everything I had tweeted that day and published it online as a batch. So if anyone wanted to scrutinize me, at least they'd have to point to exactly what I did right or what I did wrong. And um, so on the one hand, uh, you know, I, I, I did it you know, to sort of steal myself for some of that criticism, but also because I, I knew there were, there were going to be things that I could have handled a lot better. And by reading through it, I could see where those mistakes were made. And I think that's something we all should be more comfortable doing. So you really, again, you, 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 ba you both basically said the same thing, which is think about what you're doing because it's going to be viewed in retrospect, right. and also make, make make best practices to go back and have a look and see what you see how you might might improve or change time. Yeah, always reflect on what you've done, and the fact that you've got a paper trail left behind that it makes it the reflection much easier to do. We're nearly up to time, but I think there are a couple of other questions which can certainly accommodate. So one at the back there. I have a question. Ooh, sorry. I have a question for the principal. I was wondering. Sure, sorry, could, could you just say who you are? For I'm, the my name is life. Liz Bowie, and I'm a reporter for the Baltimore Sun. Um, I was wondering if you have used Facebook to try and um, prevent attacks like 
the one that took place. Um, I covered an incident in, in my jurisdiction, the jurisdiction I cover, um, where the shooter actually posted on his Facebook page that he was going to do it the, the morning before he did it. And I just wondered if um, you had thought about sort of trying to use social media as a, as a way to, to get information more quickly or to get other students to tell you things they might be afraid to walk into your office to tell you, but who would be willing to share something on social media? The last part of your question was the most important part. Uh, you know, and of course, being from Newtown, there are lots of questions usually about safe schools and whether or not we should have armed guards and how we protect kids. And the safest schools are the ones that have climates where people speak up. And so creating avenues for uh, students to be able to communicate with the school is the most important thing, regardless of whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, or a, a message box in the main office. And on the, on the point of, if you like, that, that broader idea of awareness, because you know, th this, is not, this is not, I guess, a question for, 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 for you as Newtown principal, but as a, as a principal in an American high school, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of dialogue, again, with students where often you know, such, the sort of trouble begins, as it were. What's, what's your advice, again, for kind of principals and students in, in schools who should be paying attention to this? Or? Uh, schools need to focus on two things, and that's building relationships and building resiliency in young people. Uh, and, and if we do that, then we're far more likely to uh, prevent anything like this from happening. Okay, now I think we are um, up to time. Yes, slightly over time. So um, I want to thank uh, both of you very much indeed, because I think that was a great discussion. Uh, there are lots of issues raised there. Um, I just, just, before we, just before we finish, I did want to ask w one last question, which is, um, is there, is there, is there, is there, if you like, sort of hope in the system that these things are getting better because everybody is collectively learning from each other in these communities? Because we tend to hear, and we heard again last week, bad things happened uh, in the coverage of Sandy Hook, and bad things are happening again here. Um, are they getting worse, or is, is, there, is, there, is there reason to think these are actually I, I think, evening I up? think the situation is volatile. I think last week, some, some things that happened journalistically last week, both in terms of professional journalism and citizen journalism, are low points, significant low points, I would say, in recent years. Uh, and so, but yet beyond that, I think generally speaking, a lot of good work has happened. And so uh, as long as we're willing to reflect on these things, and rather than just simply say, uh, social media and journalism is good or social media and journalism is bad, that we actually de deconstruct it in a more thoughtful way so we can uh, it, admit more directly and say, yeah, this was a good idea, but this was just a terrible idea, and let's not do it that way again. And I just, I, unfortunately, I think there are ideologues out there uh, that are involved in the social media and journalism culture wars that see it in black and white terms, whereas if we're able to be more nuanced, nuanced about these discussions, then maybe we can actually improve these things over time. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we reconvene here. Uh, we have a, a, a 15, 10 to 15 minute break. Um, grab a coffee from the back and then we're back for the three o'clock session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.